Thank you, Joey. I don't have anywhere to go but down from there. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to be with you during our class time tonight. I do want to say thank you and appreciate the elders for this opportunity. I want to thank Joey for coming up with the theme of familiar faces for this year's summer series. You know, from where I'm standing, I see a lot of familiar faces, and it's been really good to see a lot of our church family uh, up here all summer long as we've rotated from week to week. This evening, I'll be summarizing and going through the book of Esther, if you'd like to turn there. I'll try to bring out some lessons that stood out to me during my study and want to make clear to you that there is a lot more to be learned from the book of Esther than I'll have time to bring out in one class for sure. And I know that there's a lot of folks in here who probably know the details of this book better than I do. So in case you're not one of those, I do want to encourage you to read the book of Esther. It is a relatively short book. It's only 10 chapters long, and they're not all that long themselves. There's some plot twists. There's some ironies in this book. And it holds true to uh, many of the same themes of, throughout the Old Testament of, not, of God not abandoning his people during difficult times and his people being enjoying victory in the face of adversity. The book of T Esther is in the Old Testament. It's considered a book of history. It's also the only book in the Bible that God is not mentioned a single time. As we will see, though, God may not be mentioned but was ever present in the lives of his people and working behind the scenes in the lives of his people as this story unfolds. As a little background on what was going on leading up to Esther and during this time period, in 606 B.C., the Babylonians took Judah, which was a southern kingdom, into captivity. As prophesied, the Jews remained in captivity for 70 years. And that quick math leads us to 536 B.C., which is another historically significant date for the Jewish people because that is when the Medes and Persians conquered the Babylonians, ending captivity for the Jews. Well, Cyrus was the king of Persia at this time, and he allowed those Jews who were living in this land to return back to Jerusalem. Now, most of those Jews were intent on going back to rebuild the, the uh, temple that was destroyed in 586. I've read 587. I'm not sure which one it is, but in around that time period. He also allowed those Jews who wanted to remain in this land of captivity to do so. The book of Esther is about those Jews who remained in the land of captivity. As we go through this book, I want us to think about the events that unfold, think about how God is working in the lives of his people, and through his providence makes a way for his people to be delivered from certain destruction. Each chapter on this book builds on the last to tell the story, and there's a lot to unpack in this book. To start off with, you have a proud and eccentric king named King Ahasuerus, and he throws these huge feasts and invites all the nobles throughout the kingdom to come and see the opulence of his court. In the first chapter, we read about a 180-day long feast that was followed up by a seven-day feast. It's hard to imagine a celebration or feast that lasts six months long not being long enough. That tells us a little something about King Ahasuerus. He was a vain person. He was eccentric, and he was very proud. At the second feast, we meet his queen, Queen Vashti. She was a beautiful lady, we read, and the king and his vanity sent for Vashti during that second feast, that seven-day feast, that his friends and those nobles there may see her beauty. Now, we don't know a lot about Queen Vashti, but we do know that she refused the king's request. So the king gets really angry when Vashti refused. He then asks his friends, what should he do about this? And we'll see that King Ahasuerus does that a lot. He likes to allow those close to him to make important decisions about the things that are going on around him, and he doesn't think his actions through. So the king asked his friends and nobles of the kingdom to advise him on what to do about her disobedience. And they conclude that she needs to be removed as the queen. And for the sake of the rest of the women, or the men rather, in the kingdom, that a royal decree must be made that all the women should show honor and obey their husbands. These people were so worried about Vashti's defiance that it would spark some uprising among the other women of the kingdom that they made it a national crime to disobey your husband. Hard to imagine. The king's princes and close friends also devised a plan to allow the king to pick a new queen. And we read in chapter 2, verse 2, Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom 
to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. The king was having a kingdom-wide beauty contest, and these contestants would have a year to become as beautiful and charming as possible before they more or less auditioned or come before the king. King Ahasuerus, again, was over the top, to say the least. There's a lesson in this for us to learn. We must choose our friends and our allies wisely. At this point in the book so far, we've got a hot-headed king. He's let his friends talk him into kicking out his queen and holding a beauty contest to find his next queen. It sounds almost too far-fetched to be true, but as we will see, this is all part of a bigger plan to protect the Jews that remain in this land of captivity. It's at this point we learn about two of the main characters of the book, Mordecai and Esther. Now, Esther, also called Hadessa, was a beautiful young Jewish girl. She was raised by her cousin, Mordecai. Mordecai was not your average man of the day. He served in the king's palace, and he raised Esther as his own daughter because her parents obviously had deceased. Esther was then entered into this process to appear before the king, and we read about it in verse 8. When the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her to not make it known. Mordecai had instructed Esther to not reveal her Jewish heritage or that she was related to him in that process, and she never did. I think that was wise on Mordecai's part because Esther, being a Jew, just coming through, you know, being in exile, she might have not been treated the same, might have not been looked at the same as the other women who were gathered. Either way, we see Esther winning over those around her, and God is slowly using her and placing her in a position that will ultimately save his people. Well, the day comes for Esther to be presented to the king. We read here his response in chapter 2, verse 17. The king loved Esther more than all the women. and She won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes and provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. And again, we see God's providence is at work, placing Esther, an orphan, previously exiled Jew, as the new queen of this Persian empire. But that's not the only character that God is using. Mordecai finds himself in a situation at the end of chapter 2 where he discovers a plot to kill the king. He overhears two of the king's eunuchs discussing laying hands on the king and he tells Queen Esther about this and she relays that to the king and when it's investigated we read in verse 23 that uh, the men were hanged on the gallows and it was recorded in the book of the chronicles in the presence of the king. That's a very important part of the book of Esther. The good deed done by Mordecai being recorded in the chronicles of the king. We'll come back to that. Well the next character that's introduced in the book is the antagonist. He's the villain if you will. If this was a comic book, he'd be a supervillain, and his name is Haman. He's introduced in chapter 3. Haman arises as the king's confidant and close ally. He holds a position similar to what we would consider a prime minister. He's number two in command. He's a very vain and proud person. He's also power hungry, and as you read through the book, you'd think he might even want to be the king himself the way he acts. He gets the king to make a decree that everyone should bow and give him reverence as he passes by. Well, Mordecai worked inside the king's gates. And being Jewish, he would not break his Jewish laws of not bowing to anyone or any idol. And that infuriated Haman. We read about Haman's response in verse 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, he, Haman was filled with fury and he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. The people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom 
of Ahasuerus. Haman is so vain and so puffed up and so mad that he goes to the king and he gets the king fired up by telling him that there is a certain group of people spread across the kingdom who do not keep the king's laws that are troublemakers and he will take care of this problem for the king. He will destroy these people. He even offers to pay for the whole thing. So here we have a man who hates another man so much that he would kill the entire race of that man's people to make it happen. The first person I thought about when I read that was, it sounds like Hitler to me. I'm going to kill a whole race of people because he hates one person. Again, we see the king being swayed by those around him. And this time the king gives Haman his signet to stamp a decree into law. The king never apparently he never even asked who these people were that Haman wanted to do away with. He just trusts that Haman will handle these people. And he tells him in verse 11 to do with them what seems good to you. And again, we see the king letting others make decisions for him. And we must be careful ourselves in our everyday lives that we don't allow other people to make decisions for us either. The next important event in this book would be determining the date when the Jews would be destroyed. And the day would be uh, determined by playing a game. Now, we would call it dice, but in the Bible, it is referred to as pur, P-U-R, or the casting of lots. Now, this could have went down a lot of ways. Uh, the game could have been set for the date to be the next day, the next week, the next month, but instead, it was almost a year away. It was 11 months out, actually, is what I've studied and read. And I find that to be very providential in a lot of ways. God was working behind the scenes to allow his people more time. You know, if that date had been the next day or a week, there might not have been enough time for a good plan to work out and save these Jews. But instead, they had almost a year. In chapter 4, we see that Mordecai was greatly distressed when he learns about this law. And he dresses in sackcloth and ashes, and he goes out and weeps and cries bitterly. Now, he can't enter into the king's gate dressed in sackcloth. It was against the law. Esther learns about Mordecai's commotion, and she sends him clothes outside the gate, but he refused to wear them. Now, keep in mind, Esther still hasn't revealed at this point that she is Jewish or that she's related to Mordecai, so she sends her eunuch to communicate with Mordecai at the gate. And that's when she learns about this decree that would kill her and all the Jews. Mordecai then asked Esther to risk her life by going to the king and revealing Haman's plan to kill her and the Jews. You know, that doesn't sound like an unreasonable request. She was queen after all. But in verse 11, we see how, just how big of a deal that really was. Esther replied to Mordecai through the eunuch, All the th king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court, without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter, so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king these 30 days. Even though she was the queen, she could be put to death. And it was definitely a serious situation. Well, then Mordecai goes on to ask Queen Esther a question that is probably the most well-known verse in the entire book of Esther. He said to her in chapter 4 verse 14, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Notice what Mordecai said at the beginning of this verse. He said, if you keep silent, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place. Mordecai had been dressed in sackcloth and ashes, crying and lamenting at the king's gate for himself and for his people. He knows that Esther is in the best position to reach and reason with a king, but he doesn't completely count on her to deliver the Jews from this situation. Mordecai had a lot of faith that the Jews would be saved, and while he didn't know where that help would come from, he believed that it would. I think there's a lesson for us to learn in that. We can ask God to work things out a certain way, the way we want it to be worked out, and be short-sighted about that as being the only option that God can use, or we can ask God 
to help us with a situation and turn it over to him and believe that it will work out in the end. You know, ultimately, God knows what we need. He knows what's best for us. Now, that doesn't mean we will get what we want, but we have to trust that ultimately he will provide us with what we need. I think there's a song that sounds something like that. So here's Esther. She has a choice to make, and it's going to have big implications for her own life and her people. Well, let's read what she did in verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther knew she could be put to death for going to the king's presence without invitation. But she fasted for three days and asked all the Jews in this province to do the same. Again, we see a great lesson of faith and an example of how we can approach decisions in our own lives that have great consequence. We need to pray, but not just pray for what we want, but also show God how important those things that we're praying about are to us. Mordecai put on sackcloth and ashes. Esther and her ladies and the Jews of Susa fasted for three days. When something big is happening in our lives, I think it might be wise for us to show God where our hearts are too. Maybe it's by making a change in our life or living a little different or giving up something. Maybe it's fasting. If we're asking God for something big, we need to express just how meaningful what we're asking for is to us. Going back to verse 14, the last sentence, Mordecai said to Esther, And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? That's really a deep question for all of us. Why are you where you find yourself at this moment in time? Why are you working where you work? going to school where you attend, have the group of friends and acquaintances that you keep. Perhaps it is for such a time as this. Perhaps God is using and placing you for the benefit of his kingdom, and we don't even realize it. I think about our, our Bible school teachers, our Sunday school teachers. Why are they in there teaching classes that they're teaching tonight? Maybe it's to train up that next influential gospel preacher. Maybe it's a missionary that will go around the world and save thousands of souls. Maybe they're training up the next generation of Bible class teachers who will influence some little boy or little girl that's not even been born yet two or three generations from now that will go on and win many souls for the Lord's church. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, why are you here tonight for such a time as this? Maybe it's your child that will be the next leader in this church or in their community or in their own household. Maybe it's your child that's in one of these Bible classes here tonight that you brought here that will be our future elder, our future Bible class teacher, maybe even our future preacher. You know, speaking of elders, they're shepherding this congregation for such a time as this. Now, I doubt any of our elders expected to face the challenges of COVID-19 they inevitably will face other challenges throughout their lives that will affect this congregation. During good times and during difficult times and even bad times, they were placed in God's kingdom to shepherd the parish church of Christ for such a time as this. Brother Joy, the same goes for him and his family. They have been placed in our lives to work with us and to help train us up for such a time as this. You see, God's kingdom still stands. He still uses us in ways that help grow and protect his kingdom by leading others to Christ. So the next time we wonder, what are we doing? Are we doing any good here? Why are we worshiping here? Why are we studying this topic? Why are we working on VBS or a fellowship mill or some difficult craft for one of these little classes that we're talking about? Remember that you're doing it for such a time as this. We may not know all the details about what God is trying to accomplish through us, but we must be willing to accept those challenges that God gives us. And that's exactly what Esther does as we continue. So Esther goes to the king, and we see God's providence working once again. In the first few verses of chapter 5, Esther goes to the inner court. She sees uh, the king, and he extends his scepter, allowing her to approach him. 
Esther then invites the king and Haman to a feast that she's prepared for them. And uh, after the feast, the king was drinking wine, and he asked Esther again what was her request. He even offers her half of the kingdom if she would ask for it. But instead, Esther invited the king and Haman to another feast the following day, and she would then make her request known. Well, the night before that feast, honoring the king and Haman, the king can't sleep. And so he has his royal chronicles read to him. And that seems pretty fitting for this king. As vain as he was, he wanted to fall asleep by hearing stories about himself and his kingdom read to him. Well, as those chronicles are open, guess what's being read about? It's that part about Mordecai and his good deed, tipping off Esther to the plot to kill the king. Well, that same evening, Haman sees Mordecai inside the king's gate, and he refuses to show Haman honor as he passes by again. When Haman gets home, his wife and friends tell him that he should hang Mordecai the next morning and then go to the feast. Well, that sounded pretty good to Haman. So he had some very tall gallows built, 50 cubits high. That's 75 feet tall. Haman didn't just want to kill Mordecai. He wanted to make an example out of Mordecai, that anyone who didn't show him reverence or got in his way would end up the same way. Well, the king had different feelings about Mordecai at this point. He had been reminded of Mordecai's good deed. And he realized that he hadn't rewarded Mordecai yet. Again, the king still doesn't know at this point that Mordecai and the queen are cousins, and he doesn't know at this point that Haman hates and wants to kill Mordecai. Well, as Haman walks into the king's presence to ask permission to hang Mordecai, the king turns around and asks Haman how he should reward a man who has pleased the king and he wants to honor. Haman thought the king was talking about him naturally, and he replies in chapter 6, verse 7, Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. It's, it's almost humorous, really, to think about what happens next. The, the king turns and, and says, Hurry, go and do everything you just said to Mordecai the Jew, and leave nothing out. Now, I'd love to see Haman's face when he put the king's robe on, on Mordecai and led him through the city on the king's horse and heaped praises on the man that he wanted to hang. Well, that afternoon at the feast, Queen Esther is again asked what she wants from the king and told once again she can have half the kingdom if, if she wants it. We'll read what she, she says in chapter 7, verse 3. The queen An Esther answered, I have found, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted for my wish and my people for my request, for we have been sold. I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss of the king. The king asked where is said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. And then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. So the king now knows all about Haman's plan. He knows he's been tricked. He knows that this law will put his queen to death and he and all of her people, and he is mad. And he goes out to the palace gardens. But Haman remains behind to beg for his life. When the king returns, he finds that Haman has fallen over the queen's couch, and he accuses Haman of trying to assault the queen in his very presence. Well, one of the king's eunuchs looks and says, There's the gallow Haman prepared for Mordecai. And the king quickly says, Hang him on that. And Haman is put to death on the same gallows that he had built the previous day for Mordecai. That's a pretty good plot twist, and it's very ironic that Haman would be hanged on the very gallows he had built at his own place. Perhaps that was God's providence at work once again. Then we come to chapter 8. The king gives Haman's possessions to Esther, and she reveals her relationship with her cousin Mordecai. To the king. The king then gives Mordecai the position that was once held by Haman. And to fully appreciate what was taking place, we got to keep in mind the circumstances that had developed. After Mordecai was promoted, things seemed a little better for the Jews. However, the law that was designed to destroy the Jews 
was still in effect because Persian law could not be altered or changed once it had went into effect. Not even the king could change the law under Persian law once it went into effect. So the queen makes another impassioned plea to the king to make a decree to reverse that law that would destroy her people. So he does the next best thing. He gives permission to write a new law ordering the Jews to defend themselves against their enemies. He sends his finest couriers and horses across the kingdom, across all 127 provinces, to make sure that everyone knew that the Jews could defend themselves. The tables had turned at this point for the Jews, and the whole kingdom knew it. The mood in the kingdom started to change as Mordecai was placed in Haman's position in the king's court. And with this new law, the people could see that God's providence was working in the lives of these Jewish people. And many of the people of the kingdom decided to take up the Jewish faith out of fear of the Jews since they now could defend themselves. And Mordecai's fame grew throughout the kingdom. On the day that was predetermined that the Jewish people uh, would be destroyed, they fought and destroyed all ten of Haman's sons and more than 75,000 other enemies across the kingdom. A new feast was established to celebrate this Jewish victory and the deliverance from the evil workings of Haman. And that feast was called Purim, named after Pur, and uh, the game that was used to determine the date of this battle. Well, there's three points here, that, uh, and I've really blown through this book very quickly, but uh, there are three points I want us to draw out of the book this evening. The first is that God can use tragedy and difficulties to work things out for his people. God uses tragedy in Esther's young life and losing her parents to place her in Mordecai's care. That set the stage for Esther to not return back to Jerusalem to work on the temple and remain in the land of captivity in the Persian Empire. If her parents were alive, who knows whether or not she would still have been in the, that land and become the queen. We too face tragic situations in our lives all the time. And some, it's really hard and difficult to see how God is going to use and be able to use those situations for the benefit of his kingdom, but it does happen. You know, we can't foresee what God can see. And sometimes it takes a while for God's plans to come together and to work out. Esther didn't become queen overnight. It took her 12 months of preparing. And God gave the Jews 11 months to work out a solution for their problems. So things don't always happen as fast as we'd like for them to. The second point I want us to consider is that God can use everyone to work out his plans. The characters in the book of Esther are not particularly righteous people by our standards. The king likes to drink, likes to party. He wasn't particularly attached to his queen. He loved to show off all the things and opulence of his court, and he threw these elaborate feasts all out of vanity. He removed his queen when she refused to be objectified, and then he held a beauty contest to find his next queen. That doesn't really sound like somebody we would think God would use in his plans, but it turns out the king was very instrumental by allowing Esther and the scribes to write a new law ordering the Jews to defend themselves. Well, Haman obviously was a bad person. His family and friends encouraged him to murder Mordecai because he wouldn't bow down to him. You know, if they hadn't done that, though, Haman might not have built those gallows that day that he would eventually be hung on. Just like us, no one in this story or in this book of the Bible and no other character in, in the Bible except for Jesus was perfect. Yet God still used them all according to his purpose to save his people, and God can still use all of us in our faults in his kingdom as well. The third point I want us to take away is that God's people had faith that they would be delivered no matter what. Again, God was never mentioned in the book of Esther. But we do see that the Queen Esther and Mordecai were spiritual people. They fasted for three days before Esther went in to see the king. Esther knew she would be put to death, could be put to death, and finally said, you know what, if I perish, I perish. Mordecai even told Esther that the Jews would find help even somewhere else if not by her. Mordecai went on and did what many people the Bible did during this time when they needed God to deliver them by putting on sackcloth and ashes and crying out and lamenting. And while that might have been the custom of the day, we too can humble ourselves and make our petitions known as we ask our brothers and sisters to pray for us and for God's will. We can rest assured that God's providence is still at work in our own lives and in the lives of his followers today. We can also be confident that prayer and faithfulness will always lead to the best outcome, regardless of the situations that we face. Esther could have been killed for going to, to the king's inner court, 
but instead her people were saved. We thankfully do not face such extreme circumstances, but we do face choices almost daily that can affect our souls or the souls of those around us. So let's choose to be faithful and stand ready when God gives us an opportunity to do something for his kingdom. Just like God didn't abandon his people during difficult times, he won't abandon us either. And just like the Jews in the book of Esther were victorious over their enemies, we too will be victorious if we submit ourselves to God's will. I think that's about all the time I've got for this evening. As the bell rings, I just want to say thank you very much for this opportunity, for your kind attention. It's been a blessing for me to have this opportunity, and I hope that you'll be blessed by our time this evening together.